Mega Man, Jimmy Easy. Come on. Welcome to Advocacy Help Desk, a network of advocacy leaders sharing best practices and new ideas via this free podcast to help everyone in government affairs get better at their advocacy craft and having a lot of fun while doing it. Now to today's great show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Advocacy Help Desk. Thank you so much for joining us today again for our latest episode. Um, Some people may not have known, but there was an election. Uh, I know not a lot of people were paying attention at all, especially in Washington, D.C. There was a lot of things, other things going on, like NFL football and people catching COVID and stuff. So the election wasn't that important, but we're still going to talk about it a bit today. Uh, And we're still going to talk a bit about how the election is going to influence Um, the state of advocacy uh, in 2021 and 2022, um, how, you know, the makeup of Congress is going to change, the makeup of, uh, you know, an incoming new administration, um, new, you know, heads of agencies, how all that's going to impact our strategies, our ideas, Um, you know, internally with FDRA, Brian, we we had a pre-planning session before the election based on all the polls. And had it, we had it buttoned down. <laughs> election happened, and next day I was like, "Guys, I think we need to get on a call and take a look at our strategies and our our priorities. I think they're going to change." Uh, shockingly, love it. Um, so, as always, you know, I want to thank uh, Spark Influence uh, for their support of this show and Human Factor, Blake and Paula, who do the podcast and make us sound really good and do podcasts for a lot of the people. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy that uh, lately Nick has been uh, helping run some of these shows for us and bringing a lot of expertise from the Public Affairs Council. Nick, I really appreciate that. Um, and I think we'll, the show will only grow stronger as we keep bringing in great voices and great ideas. But Brian, maybe just really quickly tee up the show for us today. Um, who's on the help desk? What expert is helping us navigate this kind of new this new congressional, new government world that we're facing. We are once again joined by special co-host Nick DeSarno here. Uh, Just as a quick uh, shout out to him. Uh, Always good to see you, Nick. I'm glad to see you're feeling better. Um, The Public Affairs Council, as folks know, does great work in bringing together public affairs professionals. And especially in this time of need and with all the crazy things that continue to change, um, they are a great resource to go to to figure out exactly what's going on. You know, having problems with membership, talk to them. Having problems with advocacy, talk to them. So it's it's fantastic. And on the other side, pack.org slash jobs, always. Number one jobs website in the public affairs community. By all means, go see them. So it is great to see you, Nick. I am glad you're feeling better. Uh, today's show, we are doing a preview insight into the 117th Congress um, with our main man, Nathan Gonzalez of Inside Elections, uh, the big brain on uh, all of these things when it comes to better understanding congressional makeup, what the races are telling you, what priorities could be happening, um, what we should be looking for, what tidbits are being uncovered. So with that, welcome, Nathan. Uh, please, if you don't mind giving us just a quick background of Inside Elections and the work you do. And then I know Nick wants to jump in with some questions, although his, his, his voice is a little off today. He's feeling better. <laughs> Um, and of course, Andy does too. But if you can give us a quick background, Nathan, that'd be great. And then we'll just dive right into the 117th Congress and get rolling. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And for those of you that are listening on the, on the podcast, uh, I know you all are a classy operation. So I decided that coat and tie would be appropriate. So <laughs> Putting just us to guys. shame. <laughs> um, yeah, in, Inside Elections, we're a, a nonpartisan publication uh, that covers House, Senate, gubernatorial and presidential elections. Um, you know, I wear a few different hats. I'm also an analyst for CQ Roll Call uh, for CNN. Um, but and we also have a rela- inside elections. We have a relationship with Public Affairs Council where uh, council members can get a quarterly slide deck and, and other perks uh, perks along with that. It's wonderful. That's wonderful. No, we and and as a member of the Public Affairs Council, we always love reading your different. Uh, weekly PDFs, and then listening to you at the different conferences, and it's it's always great. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, I will kick off with a question then simply, and then we'll dive right into Nick afterwards. It's just um, the 117th Congress, right? Coming up, what we're not going to get into what went right and what went wrong, but can you give us a little bit about a makeup of the 117th and what that might mean for certain issues or priorities that you see happening right off the bat? 
Sure. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of tension. Uh, maybe that's not going to be a surprise to anyone listening to this, but there are going to be two forces at work. Um, the first one is that Washington will essentially be gridlocked. I mean, we're going to have a Democratic president. Uh, we're going to have a very narrow Democratic majority in the House. We're talking about a handful of seats, folks, uh, even though there are a lot of races that are uncalled, but we're talking in the four, five, six seat range for a majority uh, for Democrats in the House. And in the Senate, I feel like the Senate, everyone is assuming there's going to be a Republican majority, but we still have those two races in Georgia, and those are not guaranteed. There are questions about turnout mm -hmm. on either side. I mean, Biden looks like he's going to indeed win Georgia. And so uh, Democrats, the bottom line, Democrats have a chance of winning uh, of gaining control of the Senate by getting to 50-50, and then Kamala, Vice President Kamala Harris would be the tiebreaker. But even mm -hmm. if Democrats hold on, we're talking about functionally a divided Washington, functionally, I think, gridlock. And so there is going to be a requirement for bipartisanship. There's going to have to be compromise that's going to need to take place. Now, let's set that on the table. Let's set that to one side for a second, that there is going to be pressure in both parties to not compromise. There will be continued pressure on the Democratic side from the liberal or progressive wing, the AOC wing of the party to not compromise and to go big and go bold and say, hey, we just won the White House. This is our time to really push and get things done. And so, and you're gonna have these members who are not instinctually liberal or progressive, but they're going to be looking over their shoulder, wondering if they're going to get a primary challenge and wondering if they're on AOC's list. And so that there's going to be that tension. And on the other side, President Trump, even when he is not president, is still going to be in the mix. I mean, I think just uh, just earlier uh, today, there was talk about him uh, launching a live streaming channel. Um, you know, he's going to be on Twitter. He might launch a, uh, his bid for 2024, you know, within the next few days, he is going to be a constant presence. And right now, the Republican Party, the litmus test of the Republican Party is, are you for or against Donald Trump? And so that really throws a wrench into things when we're talking about Washington and getting things done, because you might have um, you might have the two parties really hashing out the details of these agreements. And then boom, one tweet from Donald Trump and the whole thing just goes, <laughs> goes up in smoke. And so there is going to be a lot of forces at play in this next Congress. Wow. Wow. Nick, um, you know, I know that you guys at the council are obviously tracking this a lot and obviously working a lot with, with Nathan and those pieces. Um, you know, what are you hearing? And then what kind of questions do you have with regards to priorities or other things for next, uh, for, for, for next month and, and obviously for the next two years? Yeah, I think it's, um, hey, thanks, Nathan, for, for coming on. And um, we've been using Nathan. I think you, you were, uh, we did something last Thursday for us. We had like 300 uh, members on a, on a Zoom webinar. And so that was really cool. And, um, you know, obviously we now know more a lot a week later. Uh, but a lot of our members are questioning, okay, so there's going to be more new members of Congress than they thought, right? A lot of moderate Democrats lost their seats. Um, you know, so that's going to be one, one challenge for them, right? Is how do they introduce themselves? How do they develop relationships for folks that they probably did not support PAC wise potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't contribute to their campaigns. Um, and then, um, they don't have the ability to go and walk, you know, the halls of Congress, right? When I was, you know, previous and, you know, when I previously worked at the association, the big day was, you know, right before inauguration, can you walk the halls the day of inauguration for, for, for new members, um, as well? Um, you know, when they get sworn into offices, you want to meet who is their new staff, they're unloading boxes, their offices, like, you know, in disarray. And that's when you come in and say, hey, you know, can I be helpful? Or, you know, is there something that you need from us that's going to make your transition? Are you, oh, you're hiring someone? Here are some people that I know are really, really great on the Hill. They're looking for, you know, legislative director positions. That's not going to happen this Congress uh, in a similar way, at least. And so, um, Nathan, I guess my question to you is, you probably have um, a better understanding because the way that you do your analysis, you're not just a numbers person. You go and you kind of really understand the district and then you usually meet, you know, and do some candidate interviews. 
Who are the kind of members of Congress that are standing out to you, the new members of Congress that you think could make the big impact? Not that there's like, you know, necessarily a new AOC in this class, um, but obviously last uh, cycle we had like Abigail, Abigail Spanberger, who's kind of now the voice of the centrist Dems. Uh, are there any other kind of folks that are, uh, you know, interesting you on the Republican side or the Democratic side that are, that are new? Yeah, that's a good question. And you're right that we we definitely had to adapt. I mean, one of our one of our kind of key pieces of what we do is meet with candidates face to face across from the table from each other and and talk about their background and everything. And we had to transfer to Zoom. And and I was a little bit leery because it's mm-hmm. not the same. I mean, in my mind, it's not the same, but it actually went fairly well. And, and in some ways, it was an opportunity to get more. Uh, I'd say focused time. Like there wasn't necessarily as much of an entourage. I mean, sometimes there were other people on the call, but when they come into the, you know, they come into the roll call offices and they got 27 people around the table and like, come on, this is ridiculous. But it, in some ways with some of the candidates, you know, it was one-on-one or there might've been one other staffer. So that was, that was uh, something that was surprising to me. But in terms of this new class, you're going to get me in trouble for, uh, for trying to point out some folks. I, I think, first of all, this is a the Republican, the new incoming Republican class. There there are a record number of women for Republicans that are coming in uh, and they are you know, already shouting from the rooftops about that. And they deserve credit for putting these candidates in position, not just women, but veterans, um, minority, uh, minority candidates and putting them in place to give them an opportunity to win these elections. Uh, but you're going to ask me about specific names. Um, I think one of them to watch and sh- uh, is uh, also from Iowa, uh, Ashley Hinson. Uh, she's a state legislator, former news anchor, uh, and I think that she's someone who uh, could be looked to. Um, she did. She is in quarantine right now for COVID-19. But when she clears that, then I think maybe uh, maybe more attention. Uh, also looking at it, there are a couple of uh, candidates running in Orange County. At least one of the races is called uh, Michelle Steele in the 48th district mm-hmm. who defeated Harley Ruda. Uh, she's the county supervisor in Orange County. Uh, and I think she'll get she'll get attention. Um, and then Young Kim, who's running against Gil Cisneros in the 39th. Uh, as of this taping, um, she is she is leading, and it looks like she will indeed win. But the race hasn't officially been called by the AP. Uh, but Young Kim ran and lost two years ago, and just and kept running. Um, the environment was a little bit better for Democrats this uh, for Republicans this cycle and, and prevailed. But there are there are lots, and I think that that's what's fun about this is that. Um, this is really, this is a whole different ball game. Being a candidate and winning is different than being a member. And we'll see who can really adapt and become that, that legislator rather than just that candidate. I like that point. I like that point. I think, so uh, it's a great question, uh, Nick. And, and, and I like the different pieces there. And of course, how you've had to transition your business, uh, uh, Nathan, with regards to how you're meeting with these people. Cause I know you do all of these interviews throughout the year, throughout the cycle. And, and obviously, this has changed that too. Also, Nick, love the dog. It's adorable. Haven't seen enough of it recently. So <laughs> I'm just letting her roam. <laughs> um, I'm wondering then, given given the makeup, right? Given what we're seeing, given some of these races that haven't been called yet, um, what do you see as things that may get traction come you know middle of January, come February? What are the issues that that these legislators, at least under the current concept? Um, are going to want to take up, are going to want to avoid? What, what do you see is happening? Where, where do you see successes? Well, I think first is going to be anything related to COVID-19, um, both from a health and health care perspective and from an uh, uh, economic perspective. Um, I'm skeptical that uh, anything huge is going to get done in a lame duck session. I mean, we'll we'll see. Those might be my my famous last words. I just don't know that there's there's an appetite for it. And and the results of the election were so mixed that both parties really feel emboldened. That's what's really strange as I've digested this over the last few days is that you know Democrats defeated an incumbent president for the first time in 28 years, and this was their main mission was stop President Trump, and they did it. Yet in Washington, we have Republicans doing victory laps because of the, the seats that they gained in the House and potentially holding the majority in the Senate. And so because no one is really feeling like they have to be conciliatory because they feel like they won, like they did, you know, they did what they were supposed to do in, in the election. So 
uh, again, I, I think the first thing that will be addressed would be anything COVID-19 related. Hopefully that's a place where we can get some bipartisanship and, and get things done because these are uh, this is critical. I mean, just watch the news, read the paper, read the websites, whatever that you know, we're not headed in the right direction on this. And, and we're going to need some sort of help on multiple levels. And beyond that, then it gets really I think it starts to get really tricky because those tensions I was talking about earlier, say there's something further on health care. You have part of the Democratic Party that wants to continue to um, to uh, say tweak or improve on the ACA. You have part of the Democratic Party that wants to go much bigger and, and much, you know, and much different. And so this is similar to what I think re Republicans had when they were in control of everything and they couldn't even agree amongst themselves what to do, let alone bring in Democrats. And now Democrats are going to experience the same thing, yet with smaller or more narrow majorities. I, you know, I'm trying to, I think since election day, I've really been turning around things in my head about Americans and their politics, right? So I know we're talking legislative body and Congress. Uh, and, and I think it, I think, you know, when we talk from our industry, when we talk about changes to our members' businesses, it's because consumers are shifting it. And I think when we talk about changes to legislative body politics, it's because in the same way, American voters are changing it. And I think it's really interesting right now that even, I think traditionally we've had really good gut feelings about where things are and how party ideology aligns. And it seems like there's a lot of churning taking place. It seems like Maybe it's just um, cult of personality with Trump pulling people one way, but it seems like working class people are really realigning to Republicans where they in the past would have been Democrat. But even on an individual level, it seems like people's political decision making is so confusing to me. Um, Nathan, I don't know if it is to you, but when I look at this and I see people making decisions for opposite reasons than they would previous elections, right? You align with the party, you have these, you know, single issue votes that you want, you care about pro-life issues or, you know, reproductive health issues or any singular thing that people align around is seemingly in some way, our gravity is lost politically uh, across America. We see pockets of Hispanics going towards Trump where we would never have assumed that that would happen. We see pockets of black males going for Trump that we would not see before. We, you know, uh, help me kind of understand or unpack how you see this kind of, I don't think it's a political realignment, but it's really confusing to understand where our advocates are because we represent many of these people. And in our association, we're, we have a split too. We have people who are very, you know, pro Biden and we have people who are very pro Trump and we have these kind of things. And I don't, you know, it's, it's increasingly hard to talk to people um, about some of this stuff. And I don't know if you feel the same way and how that's influencing things. Yeah. Well, if I could die, try to diagnose it live on a, on a podcast here. Um, I think it's still very party driven, mm -hmm. like very party, very partisan, but the, maybe the discombobulation that we're feeling. Is that a real word that I just used? Yeah, for uh, sure. <laughs> that, uh, is that is that the president, President Trump's effect on the Republican Party has been, I say, extreme. I mean, it, it's just, it's the Republican Party has become less about a party of ideology or s specific issues and more about following him as a person. And so that's where the disconnect feels weird because the emphasis of the Republican Party is completely different. It's not necessarily those traditional conservative issues. Um, it, it is at least the priority is more, well, what does the president want to do? What's his agenda and how can we how can we make sure that that happens? And so moving forward, you know, the coalitions that you're talking about, my question is whether those are semi-permanent coalitions. There are no perm I don't believe in permanence in our politics, but right. Is the coalition that the president just put together in a losing effort, is that the future? Meaning a, a, a working class, you know, bringing in more, uh, more minority voters. Is that the new Republican Party or is that just because of him as a person? And when he is no longer on the ballot, can the Republican Party hold that coalition together? Now, we should also say that, I mean, that coalition was not enough to win the White House. So what else does the Republican Party need to do in the future? But, you know, they are definitely emboldened by that coalition, again, even though it, it wasn't enough to bring the House and it wasn't enough to to uh, to win the White House. Yeah, I mean, 
it, it, I agree with this point. It's just so interesting to see. I think before this election, we were like, well, that was, um, you know, in 2016, that was Trump's high water mark. He's not going to energize any more people. There's no way after watching four years, he gets this, you know, a larger coalition of folks that vote for him, right? Because every day um, was a very interesting day under the, under the Trump administration, uh, to say the least. Um, and he did it, right? He got millions of more voters to, to vote for him. And I think, you know, that is potentially why I think Republicans are excited is that they're finding this new path. And I don't think they're sure if they can thread that needle again without Trump. Um, but they at least have hit on some core issues, you know, manufacturing, leaving America. And obviously that resonates now even more as we try to figure out how to, you know, vaccinate and take care of medical supplies that have, you know, left the country. There's a lot of issues that, that Trump really hit on um, that I think Republicans previously were not that concerned about. Um, and, and so now that they're, you know, they, they view that as, as a path, I think there's something maybe there. But um, I, I was, you know, like, like most people, I think, uh, was shocked to see millions of more voters come in for, for the president. Well, I, think um, confu- I think it confuses the legislative strategy, though, in the parties. So th- that's my second point is, if we see this churn of electorate, right, and we can't really make sense of why someone did one thing or another, and I think the Trump pool is very strong. I don't think there's realignment really happening. We'll see over time. We'll look back and see if this was the point. But I think legislatively, having said in Congress many years and worked on policy and things like that, I think more than ever, and it's, it's to, to Nathan's first point is, you have more pull as a member coming in on you than ever before. The calculus for why you make a, a vote decision is really gonna be changed because in the past we walk into an office, we have a note sheet and we know they co-sponsored the bill in the past and we know this is where they stand on the issues. But that note sheet is gonna be really kind of, you gotta use a lot of white out on some of those and like write in on other points because I think it's gonna change. And it's going to be much more difficult for for leaders as lobbyists or leading grassroots to kind of educate people because they're going to say, why did they make that decision? And it's it's the calculus of us having to explain the left side of the party pulling them versus PAC money coming in and record highs versus, you know, how, how they interpret their local district and the way it's going because they're still trying to figure that churn out. It's the calculus is is really difficult. You know, and I would say six years ago, the, cap, the, the calculus is hard, but we know the calculus. We know all the different things we know. Now it's like, really, we're, we're redoing the equations in real time and it changes maybe monthly. I don't know, Nathan, if you think that's the case that we're looking forward, that we, when we look at things going into it, we really have to be cognizant that what we assumed a month ago may not be true in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's that's part of it. And if I could put on another piece of the challenge, I would say for the adv- for you know the advocacy uh, piece of this is that um, members. I'm not sure how many members legislating is the priority. I mean, this sounds maybe crazy to say out loud, but they might look at the AOC model and and not that she. I want to be careful. Not that she's not interested in legislating, but you can use social media or other platforms or avenues to become influential without being a legislator. Like traditionally for what decades, generations, how you became influential was, you know, starting at the bottom at the back bench and just working your way up, you know, and and, and becoming that critical, that chairman or chairwoman and, and really being the the nexus of the, of the decision-making process. And that's not necessarily the case anymore. I mean, uh, you know, I would argue that AOC might be one of the, she's, she is one of the most influential people in Washington right now and more influential. There's, you know, talk, well, will she primary Chuck Schumer? I think she's more powerful than Chuck Schumer as long as he is the minority leader. I mean, when she tweets or puts something on Instagram or anything, everyone reacts, everyone and I think that you might see some other legislators, both Democratic and Republican legislators, try to emulate that and say, I can be influential, even if I'm not on any good committees. You know, they, they might just get the, the bottom of the barrel, but they can still have a, an influence and a voice and throw, even throw wrenches into the decision making process. 
Well, I, I love that point there, uh, Nathan. You mentioned this earlier. Now you mentioned it again in terms of, you know, we've heard about Trump TV for a few years now. Axios put out something this morning talking about media empire potentials. So the equation then taking all these pieces together from the calculus and, and the other pieces in the, the coalitions, advocacy groups are going to be challenged now with these equations of, you know, how do I get this, this legislator to yes? And is that going to change, do you see in terms of, okay, great, in the old days, it was, look, here are all the people I have living in your district, here's the impact, here's what we're talking about, here are the letters, here are the phone calls, here's everything I've got that supports my cause and lets you know that voting for this is the right thing to do for your people that are voting you in. Now we've got these outside factors, as you mentioned, where influence isn't earned in the same way as it was before, and now we could have a Trump tweet or an AOC tweet or... Um, as you mentioned, an Ashley Hinson tweet, maybe uh, coming through and and blowing this whole process to, to to smithereens. And so do you see advocacy groups needing to take maybe a different tact here and say, OK, great. Yes, I'm going to put these numbers together for my legislator, but I'm also going to put these numbers together for a Trump tweet or prepare for that. And I'm also going to put these numbers together for an AOC tweet and prepare for that so that the convergence of all of that may actually get us somewhere. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that sort of changing landscape there, putting all these pieces together? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure that those that are in the advocacy space that are that are doing this are already exploring all avenues, right? Don't, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. You want to be in as many places in front of as many people as possible to try to get your, your issue, your issue done. I'm still a firm believer that the reelection process is one of the best things going for maybe the country or the advocacy uh, advocacy in general, because you're not going to have that platform if you're not a member. Even if you're not, if, even if you think you're, you're not going to all your committee meetings, and you still need to be a member of Congress to have some of this, some of this sway. And so that's where making that specific case of, you know, for constituents, not what's good for the country. You know, these members, these are not members for the, these are not at-large members for the country. How does it affect? The, their constituents. And, and for some, it might be data and it might be the big numbers. For some, it might be the anecdotes and the individual stories, or it's a collection of those two things. But I, I, I really hate it when people use almost as a pejorative, they, they say, well, members just want to get reelected. It's like, well, that's how it should work. I mean, that is the part of the accountability process, but that's also the opportunity to make the case for why this is good for their constituents when it comes down to individual issues from, you know, associations or, or companies. I it's, it. um, a lot of that sounds like, I mean, it sounds like we're just talking about more noise because we assume if Trump was voted out, there would be less, but it sounds like he's still going to be there. People are going to find other ways to get it going. And, and Nick, I know from the public affairs council, you guys are always trying to help your, your members learn all this stuff, but also, you increasingly talk about setting expectations, right? Like we constantly have to educate people that it is a process. Things aren't going to, just because there's a new presidency doesn't mean things are going to pass overnight, you know? And it's, and it's really difficult to talk to our members who expect, you know, may not be educated about all these things and expect real change really quickly and, and be disappointed and, and still keep them enmeshed with our associations, you know, and, and involved so that when something can move, we're there to move it and they're not discouraged. Well, and I think Nathan's point even, you know, we don't know if we're going to have divided government yet, right? But no matter what happens, we're going to have divided government, right? You know, it's going to be a very close Senate. Um, even if it does swing to the Democrats, you're still going to have Manchin and other folks who are extremely moderate Democrats. And then the same thing in the, in the House, um, you know, AOC and the squad and other folks that are on the really far kind of left are not necessarily going to vote for bills um, that don't have their priorities in it. And they did it previously. And there's no suggestion that they're going to stop now that their majority is smaller. Um, so the six or 10, you know, I forget what Nancy, Nancy Pelosi said, like, you know, AOC has one vote. Um, well, now that vote is a lot more impactful, right? And she can influence maybe 10, 12, 15 other really progressive members of Congress. And, you know, it's the same thing that John Boehner had or um, uh, Paul Ryan and all these folks where you have the, you know, we, it was a Freedom Caucus then. I, I don't know what the caucus is going to be called. 
progressive wing or you know they should come up with a name probably eventually <laughs> other than the squad um and, and you know it, it's going to have a tremendous impact on politics uh, nathan what, what's kind of uh, switching a little bit um you obviously talked about polling and you talked a little bit about um previously when we, we've, been, we've been doing this how in 2016 the polling was pretty on point um and now in you know it was, it was or, or sorry in 2018 it was pretty on point in 2016 it was off and obviously in 2020 it was off, right? And so there's this idea that there maybe there's like a Trump factor that uh, is disrupting some polling, that polling is not fundamentally broken. As public affairs professionals, we rely on polling all the time, right? We want to know on different issues, um, where do people stand? You know, are we moving the ball? We talk like, you know, pharmaceutical companies are constantly talking about how the prices are so high because of innovation. They want to see their, their reputation improve, right? And so they're measuring that. It, and that's all public polling. Uh, do we see public polling having kind of a, another reckoning or is this going to be kind of similar to 2016 where we're like, oh, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And there's some conversations, but then you never really hear like, okay, this is how we fixed it. Yeah. This is, and I'm glad this is a four hour podcast so we can cover this. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the wrapping uh, up. Three hour <laughs> tour. Maybe, maybe if I just talk about this, from a very personal perspective, I mean, say personal and from a, you know, someone who runs a small business, a newsletter that is partially dependent on polling, both public and private, partisan and nonpartisan polling. Um, I'm not convinced that public opinion polling is irreparably broken. I think it is very clear that there is problems with polling when Trump is on the ballot. And um, and in 2018, I, the, as you said, the polling was pretty good our, in our projections in the House and the Senate were pretty darn good based on polling. And, and I think maybe I got a little bit, I might've got a little bit overconfident that, you know, going from 2016 to 2018, okay, we did, you know, we, we did it, we, we turned out okay. And that might've led to some overconfidence leading into 2020. You know, we have to remember that what happened this cycle, the polling had been pointing toward Joe Biden winning and Joe Biden won, right? This is not the same thing as 2016, but what, sort of say killed us or what happened, the margins were significantly different. And those margins, Trump overperforming the polls had a tremendous impact on the House and the Senate. And, and so if we bring it back to, from, from my perspective, what I'm wrestling with uh, at Inside Elections is um, how, we're, I'm not gonna just not, I'm just, I'm not gonna ignore polling. I, it's just because, and I'm encouraged by, the partisans that have a vested interest in getting this right. You know, they need good data in order to make millions of dollars worth of strategic decisions. And the same thing goes for the, you know, on policy that there are people that are relying on good data to make other strategic decisions. So I'm, I, I take some, um, I'm encouraged by that there will be a lot of effort into solving this at the same time. I am thinking about and exploring ways, how can we uh, diversify, make sure that our business model is diverse and not just dependent on public opinion polling, because it is clear that there are some challenges in that space that need to happen. So I'm, I'm kind of doing both things at the same time. Okay, yeah. I, I'm not throwing out the polling, but I don't want to have my entire business and my for feeding four kids uh, you know, based on the ups and downs of public opinion surveys. One of the things I'm curious to see in the kind of autopsy, and I think we're really far away from an autopsy because, you know, it's not like this is clearly finished. Um, we're still yeah. counting millions of ballots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, California is still rolling them in. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that I think that's, you know, important to, to realize that there's going to be a final count similar, you know, Hillary Clinton, it was weeks and weeks um, before we got a final count. Um I'm curious to see if online polling ha has has helped at all. You know, there's kind of still been this kind of, uh, if you want to go in a real like rabbit hole, there's fights between pollsters all the time on Twitter and, and people that aggregate polls and put certain polls in the aggregation and not. Um, and I'm curious to see if online polling is any, you know, better because I, I just think the, um, the end of calling people on their phone and getting them to tell you the truth uh, and getting the right people, right? Right. You know, uh, not just two Trump supporters, but getting, you know, 200 Trump supporters um, is difficult. And I, and I wonder if, if online makes it any better. 
Yeah, it, it feels like multimodal uh, is is the is the mm -hmm. direction, um, and not just one reaching people in one specific way. But then, how is that sample put together? And then we're veering into not a scientific survey. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that the po that, that the data are wrong, um, or those aren't real people. But it's different. It's mm -hmm. it, we would have to evaluate it in a in a different way, but you're right. The whole, Oh, are they getting enough cell phones? And it's like, nah, that we're beyond that. Now we're just basically, you know, phones in general, is that the right way? And one of the emerging theories coming out of the, that I'm hearing coming out of the polling from for 2020 was that you had, you had a combination uh, with uh, of factors with COVID-19 that you had a, maybe a larger number of people with a college degree who had the ability to work from home and were more than willing to tell someone on the phone for 15 or 20 minutes how mm. mad they were at the president. Uh, whereas you had people without a college degree that were working on the front lines of the, of, of, uh, of mm -hmm. during the coronavirus, then when they get home, the last thing I want to do is answer 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Uh, and, and those people might've been more likely to support president Trump. So that's one of the emerging theories that we're hearing, but we're, we're a ways out from, I think really, knowing or diagnosing what happened. So Nathan, we have three hours left. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you want to touch on next. Uh, no, my, honestly. My four-year-old will be joining us for the last three awesome. hours. I love it. Yes, <laughs> we've, had, we've had Nick's dog, your four-year-old. I think this is great. Um, I always have a page full of notes here between everything we've talked about with sort of, we have a very divided Washington, uh, no matter how it ends up, even if it is a 50-50 split in the Senate. Uh, we have potential members who could be interesting to keep an eye on in terms of who could be growing. We have this outside forces now with the president who's looking to start his own media company and potentially could throw just, you know, bombs at things. Um, and, you know, while we have critical items up front in COVID-19, there are going to be other things, obviously, that people want to talk about and people want to look at and we've got to work. And as you said, the idea that, that um, you know, uh, folks getting reelected and that's their goal, that, that, that's actually a positive thing that, that helps drive change because they want to make a difference for their folks and they want to make things better for their districts. And so um, I hey, Brian, thank can you I, a lot. Can I, can oh, I ahead, interject please. one thing? Because yes. I think this is going to be a, a key. We have to remember we're entering a redistricting cycle mm -hmm. and that is going to throw an entirely different, an entirely other layer onto this that you're going to have members maybe a member who has not had a, a difficult reelection, who is suddenly gonna be drawn into a district against an incumbent, maybe an incumbent from their party, maybe an incumbent from, an, from another party, uh, maybe their district gets blown up uh, to where you, we, I think, you know, traditionally we see retirements, more retirements because yep. um, members find themselves in just a, a completely different political situation that maybe they don't wanna deal with. And so that kind of throws that has a legislative angle when you have maybe more wild card members in the mix who are not going to be looking at getting reelected. Mm -hmm. So what do they do then if they're not feeling that pressure from various constituencies that they might have if they decided to run uh, for another term? So just to make it more complicated, yeah. let's throw in let's throw in redistricting. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Nathan, for joining us. Uh, always fantastic insights. Uh, sadly, no dad jokes this time. We didn't really give you the opportunity for it. I'm, <laughs> I'm out of practice. I'm just been sitting but, in this, my son's bedroom. I got, I got to get some more. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We'll, we'll work it out next time. Um, I'll throw it to you, Nick, and thank you again for uh, for joining us as a co-host. Always great. Again, pack.org and pack.org slash jobs. Uh, they're their most visited page. They have fantastic resources for anybody in the public affairs space. Um, it's great to see you. Thanks again, Nathan and Andy, uh, if you take us out. Yeah, I'll take it up. I, I think kind of to summarize just a, a few more points, I think as we leave, it is something that we do need probably to have Nathan back on to talk about redistricting. The first thing I did the morning after the election was look at state legislative maps. And my wife was like, what are you doing? And I was like, this is, this is nerdy, but this is, this matters. Right. Like, cause I remember my boss, we were looking at redistricting in, in 2010 and it was like, gosh, like, where are we picking up? Where are we losing? Right. That becomes real discussions and your makeup of, of who you're advocating to and telling a story to in Congress really does change. So Let's, let's have Nathan come back and discuss that at some point when those kind of discussions start heating up. Um, but also just, just to add to the polling, what else do we have? 
right? I don't see anything other new innovative idea that someone has to judge where public opinion is headed. I mean, Coca-Cola still uses polling to determine where they're going to launch product and what product they're, I mean, this is the conversation around polling is dead is ridiculous. Um, I think, I think part of that, uh, part of the challenges, and I was talking to uh, my good friend who runs Emerson College Polling, which is pretty, pretty good polling system. He always said the challenges were not educating folks enough to realize that the polling is not a fact, it's a narrative, right? It's a moving target that we're trying to hit. We're telling a story, we're telling trends, we're trying to pull out things, but people and media still keep trying to tell you that it's an absolute certainty that this is right, correct? So part of, part of that is, having that narrative effect of the polling gives us the best data possible, but maybe not, maybe not exact, right? hundred percent. So some of that, but I think, you know, I think as we go forward, the real challenge from this conversation that I see um, Brian and Nick is there's going to be more noise and it's going to be harder for us to, to get down to the signal level and to, to separate the facts from the fictions and to focus our advocates and keep them focused on what we're trying to do, right? Because it, it's going to be so easy for them to go all over the place and get really fired up or become cynical really quickly. And we've got to keep them even keeled and focused on what our job is and what we're trying to do as an issue. So um, part of that too is what we do here on Advocacy Help Desk. We try to get through the noise and help uh, everyone in advocacy and in lobbying, get some ideas, get some tips and best practices to be a little bit better at their game so they can help their folks out there uh, move the policy dial in the right direction. Um, I, I also want to echo um, thanks to Nathan for coming on. And again, thanks to Nick for continually helping raise the bar here where I'm trying to lower it uh, with bad jokes um, and bad ideas. He compliments us well to bring us back up to level. And of course, Brian, who, who always keeps us on point and even killed and always has great ideas and all the folks that he works with brings a lot of perspective, this industry working in it many, many years. And I I'm just really thankful we're heading towards the holiday season um, and Thanksgiving in particular. And I'm really thankful for, for this show. When we started the show, we didn't know where it was going to head. Um, we pick up more and more people every single week. And I really appreciate all the listeners out there. I appreciate all the kind notes that are sent. And more so, I appreciate folks who email us asking us questions. Um, and our whole goal is to help you. And we can pair you with someone who has an expertise in a certain field, topic, or idea that you may have. This is a free podcast where we're really trying to help people in every single industry get a lot better at their game to help as many people across the country as we can. So please keep listening. Go back to our entire catalog, absolutelyhelpdesk.com. If you have an idea for a guest we should have, a topic we should talk about, you can drop us a line on absolutelyhelpdesk.com as well. Um, and for that, you know, I've got nothing left except to say, keep advocating.